Well, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first ACS Publications and ACS Division of Chemical Information webinars. Um, my name is Michael Chu. I'm the Library Relations Manager with ACS Publications, and I'm also a member of the ACS Division of Chemical Information, or maybe referred to as SIMPH. I will be serving as today's moderator for the webinar, and I'm excited to announce this new quarterly webinar series for our uh, chemical information, chem informatics, and research community. A few logistics before I turn it over to our speaker today. You will notice on your screen, uh, also known as the console, there's a Q&A box. So please feel free to leave a question anytime for our speaker. If you have a technical issue with the webinar platform, please use the same box to ask a question. Our webinar partner, ON24, has staff on hand to remedy any issues you might have. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today, uh, Tony Williams. Tony is a computational chemist at the National Center of Computational Toxicology, working on delivering uh, the center's data to the scientific community. He's an analytical uh, scientist by training, specializing in nuclear magnetic resonance. He has over two decades of experience in chem informatics and chemical information management. He has authored over 180 papers, book chapters, and books regarding computer-assisted an analysis of data, chem informatics, and chemical information management. He is also passionate about teaching scientists how to benefit from the developing array of social networking tools and is known as the chem connector on uh, many of these networks. Over the years, he has had adjunct roles at a number of institutions and is presently uh, enjoys working with scientists at both UNC Chapel Hill and NC State University. He was the recipient of the Jim Gray Award for eScience in 2012 and the American Chemical Society's North Carolina Distinguished Speaker of the Year Award in 2016. And it is now my pleasure to welcome Tony Williams and turn over the <clears throat> webinar controls to him. Tony? Thank you, Michael. Much appreciated. Uh, so I'm sure uh, many of you uh, will have heard me uh, speak over the years, I hope, about um, how some of these tools are becoming useful for us as scientists. Uh, I've been running a blog for a number of years, and since I started that, things have changed so dramatically uh, in regards to what is available for us as scientists to use. So, so today uh, I will be hitting on only some of these. There are, there are such a myriad of, of possibilities for you to use. I've spent a number of, number of years investigating which of these tools uh, fit best with what I do, and I'm going to walk you through how I use them and how you, they can be used to your benefit. And originally, the, the social networking aspect was there, but I, I realized that, uh, as well as in conversation, that social networking tools are more like Twitter and Facebook. Online networking tools just co is a more encompassing um, term, so that's what I've actually started to use. Uh, I, I've given a number of talks about how uh, we as scientists have a responsibility to market our own work, and this can be interpreted sometimes as something that we shouldn't do. The pure science should speak for itself. But I think we would all agree that we operate in a very noisy environment of increasing number of publications. Uh, we're all very short of time. Uh, there are so many things that we may be interested in, but unless somebody shines a light on it for us, we're actually not going to see it. We have to figure out how to, how to um, point people to our work commonly so that it can actually get the attention that it deserves. And we therefore get feedback we can develop collaborations, we get to share our work with a larger community. So recently, uh, uh, somebody at North Carolina State University um, actually made this particular comment uh, in an article. I, I was interviewed for a Nature News article about uh, one of these platforms called Kudos that we'll touch on, and um, Matt actually made the comment, it's not the job of researchers to become experts in public relationships, uh, public relations, which, which we all agree is true, I think, but Scientists should be tooting their own horns as well, because not everybody's going to be able to focus on your work and share it the way that you would. My hopes for today is to actually encourage you in the era of participation, because we have tools available to us today that absolutely allow us to engage a larger audience and, and, uh, and spread the, the wealth of what we're doing um, in, in a myriad of ways. Uh, and then the question you have to ask is, do you have the time available? Do you wish to make this commitment? Do you wish to engage? That is absolutely your decision. 
I'm going to provide an overview of some of the tools, not all. That's a much larger uh, two, two, three-hour um, workshop that I've that I've led uh, of late, um, because there are you know there are so many things to use. I'm going to share some some stories, statistics, and strategies that that I've, that I've noticed over the years and have analysed, uh, and I encourage you to participate not only for yourself because there are many benefits to yourself, but also for the for the overall community and for the sake of science itself. I hope as an outcome for those of you who don't already have an orchid that you will choose to claim one. I hope that you will consider investing about two hours per month on your profile, and I will, I will say that there is an activation barrier to getting onto these systems. Um, so the first couple of months will certainly be more than that should you choose to participate. And uh, my hope is that you'll have a bigger impact online. You may be having an excellent impact in science already, but online is becoming this the, the, the modern way for people to become more and more aware of you, as well as to engage with you as well as to engage with your work, your data, et cetera. So scientists, we're, we're always being uh, evaluated on statistics. And whether or not some of this uh, bodes well uh, with you about how we are measured, this is mostly representative of reality. So people are looking at our data. How much data do we generate? What is the quality of our data? Is it useful? And the software that we may produce, of course, the number of publications, uh, peer review, our involvement in peer review, um, publications have changed also, they come in different flavors, contributions to Wikipedia in many ways is a publication at this point, uh, your blog posts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, posters and presentations at conferences, of course our theses and dissertations, increasingly our performances in film and audio, um, you know, our slide decks that get narrated like this and then get shared, et cetera, and then so many other forms of research that we have. And we're being evaluated on this on a consistent basis. Uh, I think it's important to actually assume a brand. And our primary brand is our name and what, and what we do. Um, I chose to actually brand myself <clears throat> when I set up a blog um, and I wanted to start engaging in these networks. I, I chose a brand called Chem Connector. And today that, is a, that has become a lot of what I do, is connecting people to data, to research, and people to people, collaborators to each other, et cetera. Um, and that's something you could choose to do, but not necessary. Um, it's become very valuable for myself. My primary CV, and we all need to keep a CV updated, uh, in my belief, uh, for, for, for myriad of reasons. People ask for it all the time when I'm giving speaking engagements, for example. Uh, my primary CV is my blog, and the reason I do that is it's very public. It allows me to actively link everything that I produce using the online linking systems to presentations, publications, via DOIs, etc. This is, again, not something you necessarily have to do, but I found very useful over the years. I hope that many of you online are actually already uh, proud owners of an ORCID ID. If you, if you are not, uh, I would encourage you to look at it. Uh, there's already over 3 million issued. Um, increasingly, I'm being asked to provide my ORCID ID when I'm submitting publications. So recently for the ACS, for the RSC, for Springer, uh, I'm giving my ORCID ID. And this is a way to disambiguate you as a researcher. It also pulls together a lot of your publications, presentations into one uh, single place. You control how this comes together. You can um, submit the information and control it yourself. And I think this is, an, this is an also a good place to have a very visible form of your CV. These data are commonly open, can be consumed by other systems. And I think over the next few years, we're just going to see the importance of ORCID uh, grow uh, in our domain of science. Uh, this, isn't, this is just a, a snippet of what you see from my own uh, ID here. You can see left-hand side that I have, I've had a number of previous labels. Um, notice there is no H in my name, but there are many Anthony Williamses with, with H in the name. And this is, this is my page that I claimed and everything links back to this. Uh, you can see some of the keywords describing what I do and a whole series of works <clears throat> that I, I have actually uh, made sure that they connect to my, to my profile, book chapters, papers, but also my presentations that are available encourage you to investigate this in more detail than I can cover here in this particular uh, presentation. 
The most basic career networking tool, in my opinion, is LinkedIn. Uh, it has been around for many years now. I imagine that most of you online uh, have a LinkedIn account. Certainly when I give presentations, while people are not using many of the, of the other platforms I speak about, almost everybody has a LinkedIn account at this point. Um, and they use it at a very, very basic level. They use it to register themselves as this is, this is who I am, this is where I work, this is a little bit about my previous experience. And for me, that is, that is not even the most basic entry point. I think you should be talking about those activities that are beneficial for anybody who is looking to hire and to review and collaborate with you to see what you're interested in, what you're active in, what your work has been over the past couple of years. I don't think there is any point in your career really that is too young to join LinkedIn. I've had students even at the degree level say, well, well, what do I have to say about myself? And my point is, when you're already starting your, your degree, that you should be considering that as, as a path on your career. You should already be representing the work that you do. And I'd like to show you how some of that has been expanded by myself and encourage you to consider this as the place the human resources people and people hiring um, are going to. Certainly when I am reviewing a set of um, resumes, I, I immediately go to this site and see what people have, have been able to expand on outside of their classical resume. So it can also uh, uh, function as an electronic CV for sure. Uh, and when you've populated this page, it is possible to download a form of that. This is an example of uh, my previous uh, when, uh, part of my previous career when I worked at Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, it lists projects that I've been involved with. It lists the names of some of the people that I was networked with and, and get um, recommendations from those people as uh, when I was uh, at the Royal Society of Chemistry. I believe you should be doing that as you go throughout your entire career and making sure that you are formally connected to people um, in, in your job. Uh, you can highlight projects. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of uh, very significant projects I've been involved with over the year, very proud to have been involved with them. Um, when I was working for the RSC, UK National Chemical Database, you can see some of the names of the people involved in that project, Colin Batchelor, Valery Kachenko, myself, and there are others uh, that you can see there. Uh, Open Facts Project, which is a very big European project. And it really is a matter of saying this is when it started, this is when it finished, these are the people I, were, I was involved with. And it, it, the network that you're involved with in you, throughout your career says a lot about um, your skills, I believe. I think it communicates your ability to participate in a team, et cetera, et cetera. So almost all of us have had projects in our career that we can highlight as being significant. I wish that LinkedIn actually had the ability to consume digital object identifiers and take title and abstract and uh, link back to the original paper. But, but as, far as, I'm, as far as I know, they're still not there. Uh, but I do manage to update uh, the articles as I, as I publish them. I, I extend an invitation to my co-authors to be listed uh, on this, and then they can actually take advantage of this themselves and list it on their own LinkedIn profile. Uh, I don't put every publication, book chapter I've ever had on, on LinkedIn. Just choose the ones that you would like to highlight. Uh, as you do this, your LinkedIn profile can actually get very, very long, and you, you need to stay on top of pruning it. Um, there is a point at which it is too much uh, to, to consume. Uh, as you grow your your network, and I think last count, it's something like 2,000, over 2,000 people network to me, um, I tend to turn down uh, a significant number of invitations. If I've not met somebody, if I've not engaged with them in some manner, uh, if they uh, don't have an overlapping network with me, then I tend to, to actually decline. If there is a particular reason that somebody is choosing to network with me and they generally put that in an invitation and for, uh, for me to connect to them, then, then I will engage with them before even accepting uh, commonly. But as you add information now to your LinkedIn profile, it actually gets spread through the network that you've already established. So when I add a presentation to my LinkedIn profile, when I share a comment on a project that I'm working on, it goes out to my network. And for those of you who use LinkedIn, 
almost certainly you're already getting emails from LinkedIn telling you that there have been people sharing information. When you log into the platform for the first time in a couple of weeks, you should be able to see a whole lot of information that has been shared with you. I find this a very beneficial way to stay up with my networked colleagues in the field, uh, and I use it essentially daily at this point, including weekends. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what everybody's up to. And many people can only get to using it at the weekend. I would uh, suggest you ask for recommendations. Um, you don't want to extend an invitation to your plumber and ask how, what do you like as a client. That is not the right thing to do. But the people you work with, the people you publish with, the people you, you um, interact with, who you believe uh, would be willing to do this. Um, I don't always respond to all recommendation requests myself. Um, you have to uh, do this on, a, on, a, on a, as appropriate basis. You need to make the call whether you're willing to make a recommendation or not. Um, but I do believe it's a valuable part of your of your representation online. Endorsements is a little more tricky. Uh, people do endorse you for for many things. Um, uh, some of the people I I've been involved with on Simf have in, have endorsed me for numerous things, uh, and I have chosen to not take the endorsements because I don't really want them to feature on my profile. Uh, I want to be seen to be. Um, participatory and strong in certain areas of science and others I choose to, to play down. This list of endorsements is totally under your control. You can go in and you can prune these out as appropriate. Uh, and somebody once said to me that if five people call you a horse, saddle up. And by that I mean take a look at my profile and I am seen certainly as a chemist, that is 99 people uh, plus have said I'm a chemist, that's true. 99 people plus say I'm an analytical chemist, also true. I've, I've published in that area for many, many years, it's my PhD. But 99 plus people say I'm in d drug discovery. Uh, and I've never worked in a pharmaceutical company. Um, I've never discovered a drug. But of course, I have published in drug discovery journals and I have worked with people who do drug discovery. But this is how the, how the community sees me. These are, these, this is how it sees my strengths, uh, which is quite an interesting uh, view of, of yourself to get this coming in through a set of, of independent filters. So I think it's valuable to ask for these. And again, you control them. Uh, what I do like at the end of uh, all of this um, aggregation of information, which will take time to pull together, uh, especially later in your career when you have so much to include, at least at the end of it when somebody says, can I get a copy of your most recent P uh, CV, uh, one button click and you can generate an instant summary as a PDF file. Uh, as I said, th these can end up to be too long, but it is interesting to see how you are summarized on a platform such as LinkedIn. And then you can adjust as appropriate to prove it down. So that's the LinkedIn platform. Um, now LinkedIn actually uh, acquired a, a different platform called SlideShare a number of years ago. And I believe the reason they did this was they realized that many of us as professionals are constantly presenting. We are out in the public. Uh, we're giving presentations on the work we do. Uh, I love the SlideShare platform. There are many others. There are many other places that you can share your, your presentations as you give them. But here, when I share my presentation via SlideShare, one button click and it shows up directly on LinkedIn. So people in my network who are following me will actually get to see that I've just shared another presentation. And at this point, Microsoft actually owns LinkedIn and SlideShare, and I believe that they see the great opportunity in the strength of networking across professionals. I'm not sure what the business model is behind that yet, but uh, I'm sure they have one in mind. So in terms of presentations and slide decks and documents and reports, uh, SlideShare is not just about presentations. You can add PDF files there, uh, you can add reports, you can add preprints, you can share all forms of documents. And the way I think of this is we need to use these platforms to make sure that the work we've invested in our science can be shared to the largest possible audience. So uh, I'm sure while I've been speaking, you've been reading this. Considering the amount of uh, time that is invested in research, just going into a paper, um, wouldn't it be ideal if you could actually invest your, your time and resources at some level to, to market that out to a larger community? And in terms of a presentation, I can fly around the world, 
end up in a room with 20, 30, 40 people, give a presentation. My, my, uh, my organization has paid for my time to do the work, my time to make the presentation. They've flown me across, across the world or across the country. I'm in a room and I have 20 to 30 minutes to, to, to derive the most value as possible to the audience in that room. And my belief is that work should be proliferated following that presentation. So I believe those slide decks, if you're allowed to, if you're allowed to make them public, should be shared so that other people can take advantage. And SlideShare is the primary place I do that nowadays. And I, again, I have used others. This is an example of sharing all of my works online. I think I have over 300 um, PowerPoints now on SlideShare. I generally add my latest PowerPoint within 24 hours of giving it. Uh, you can see um, highlighted there in the red block, it says add it to profile. So that goes right out to my profile. And I can see counts uh, of how many people have looked at it, how many people have downloaded it, et cetera. Very easy to do, very simple to take advantage of. It's also highly accessed. So here's an example of in one week, I've got over 1,000 views on my slide decks. One of my slide decks at this point has over 25,000 views. And I recall giving the presentation at an ACS meeting in Philadelphia on the last day to about 15 people. But his, it has been looked at 25,000 times since then. So the SlideShare can be highly accessed if you've been able to do the work to build up the, the, the network following. So it doesn't come for free. You actually have to do some work uh, to develop that, that network and following. But here's an example of one year, 84,000 views on my slide decks. Um, and they get used and they get repurposed, and I'm okay with that. That is the point of what I do is to share what I do so that people can take benefit out of it. I know many of my colleagues in the field do the same. As I said, SlideShare is not just slides. I add documents here, infographics, videos you can upload. So you can take advantage of the work that you've done and, and continue to share it. And here it remains accessible um, for, forever. People can keep taking, taking it adding comments and developing collaborations with you. And I've actually developed full-blown collaborations from sharing slide decks through here. ResearchGate is another tool that many people have used. I, I have heard some irritation on the number of emails that you get from ResearchGate. I, I encourage you to go into the profile settings and control how many emails you receive. Uh, this is a place where I, uh, I get notifications directly that ResearchGate has identified a publication associated with me, um, a couple of clicks, and the fact that that publication exists online and is accessible via a DOI, et cetera, that is a fairly automated way for me to add to my ResearchGate profile so that people can see it. Again, I have a, a, a developed a following over the years um, so that people are immediately finding everything that I post is connected through here. Not everybody follows me on LinkedIn. Not everybody follows me on ResearchGate or Twitter, which is another place I share. So all of these places, however, can be connected with a few tweets, a few posts, and the network actually comes alive to connect people to this information. Uh, it says I have 347 publications, which classes, clashes with what Michael said, because publications here are also classed as things like my presentations, so some of my reports, um, some of what I would call more marketing-like documents, uh, they don't always have to be peer-reviewed publications. Uh, you get all types of statistics from these systems. So LinkedIn, its primary statistic is how many followers you have and, and how many times your, your profile has been viewed. ResearchGate will tell you about how many views have you had of your publications in total in the last week, whether there are new citations to your work, and what is, an, what is the accurate count of citations. That's very difficult. If you compare Google Scholar citations with ResearchGate, with other platforms, you will not find one number. And, and I don't think it's possible to identify one number. But generally, they're all fairly close. Um, you will sense some differences. The email at the bottom uh, it says with 155 new downloads, blah, 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 blah. It's nice to get these emails that tell you that you are actually being, being followed, people are paying attention to your work. Uh, it's also very easy to get, a, to get these types of emails when you're, you're in a team of two. So uh, this, is from, this is an old email I once received saying, most downloaded, downloaded researcher from your department. 
Well, that was when I was working from home building ChemSpider with an old friend of mine. So, um, you know, it's it's a lot nicer when you're in a large department and suddenly you see that your work is being is being uh, noticed. Uh, there's also another platform called Academia, academia.edu, um, which is, in my opinion, uh, a little more uh, towards the social sciences than towards science, but I use it as a chemist for sure. I started using this because I met the person who was um, the CEO of the group that was building this. Uh, I like it, um, but I do put, I, I'll admit, I put more effort into ResearchGate than academia, simply because of lack of time. I can only invest so much time. Um, both both uh, platforms I encourage you to take a look at personally. Uh, if you write book chapters, you may or may not know, you can have an author's profile on Amazon. And this is very easy to set up also. Um, because I'm an Amazon user, I, I get to claim this page very easily. And if you can do it, and my tweets show up live here, of course, Amazon lists. Um, I claim the book chapters in the books I'm in. And of course, what they're trying to do is put my books in front of their audience to sell them. I'm okay with that. It's a nice place for me to aggregate everything that I've ever published in a book uh, on Amazon. You have to carefully control uh, what you put there. Make sure that everything that is listed and associated with you is actually your own work. Many of us are doing peer-reviewed uh, science, and we appreciate the contributions that our, our colleagues make to review our stuff. Well, we also put work into reviewing their uh, science, their publications, and it, it's always been a concept that people should get credit for this. And Publons is one uh, platform that I use to do exactly this. There is another one called Reviewer Credits. Um, there's a couple of other ones around with the publishers where they, they're trying to give you credit for the work you do. I think Elsevier has one at this point, uh, maybe the other publishers. But Publons is independent, and it allows me to claim uh, the journal uh, that I have, I have reviewed for. It actually allows me to enter my review, the title of the article that I reviewed. My entire, my entire review can go right there. It doesn't go public. Um, until the article is published and the publisher themselves allow me to release my review. Uh, and that is a personal choice. You don't have to release your review through here. Uh, you can choose to, to um, keep it on the site and not make it public. But what happens with time throughout the year as you do more and more reviews, you get to actually list all of the journals that you've published for. Um, you get to see the counts that you've, you've done, the, the uh, your, your general um, performance of review in terms of word count relative to other people in your domain, inside your institutions, etc. I'll note, have you note on the left-hand side, you see an ORCID ID here. ORCID proliferating now across many of these sites, uh, and that is to be expected because it, it is a great way to disambiguate and connect everything. Um, add to LinkedIn that, that this has issued a badge that shows in my LinkedIn profile. So people know that I actually um, am, am a participant on Publons. And of course, share on Twitter pushes my profile out there. Uh, I've encouraged a number of uh, colleagues over the past couple of years to look at this site. And everybody who started to use it has realized that it is beneficial to them to be able to share, this is how much peer-reviewed science, this is how much peer review I'm doing in my field uh, during a year. You see your entire profile gone live. I encourage people doing it to uh, to take a look at that. This is Kudos. Um, this is a, an, a, an application that I started to use to enrich my peer-reviewed publications and to uh, share them with a larger community. Um, I think it's a very simple to use uh, platform. Everything I'm talking about here, of course, is, is toll-free. It costs you nothing to use. Uh, their business model they have figured out behind the scenes for them to keep these platforms running. The benefit to me is I believe that this site uh, gives me the right and, and process by which to claim articles, to write a little bit about them in more common language, and to share them to the network through the network effect of kudos that has a lot of followers and engagement. So in this case, it says add a short title. So this could either be the title of your publication or a distilled version of it. Tell your readers what your publication is about. 
So this isn't your full abstract. This is a short, succinct description of what the work is, and then tell the readers the significance of your publication. So make sure that you can indicate to them um, what the benefits of this work actually is, what you're trying to report, what the successes are. So this is explaining your publication. Now, publication is a point in time. Uh, we've done work, we've written it up, we've, we've encapsulated it into, in, into a document that has gone through review, and it's done, it's finished. Maybe there could be some errata to follow, but it's pretty much independent of this publication for a period. What about all the work that follows? What about in the new modern world that we, we live in where people can actually comment on that work, where they can uh, write a blog post about it, where they uh, may reuse your data, reanalyze it, and, um, and publish independently. What about work that comes from the work that you've done, is published without you as an author, is independent, but you are the catalyst for that work with your originating uh, work? I believe these are all important things to do, and we do have citations, of course. We hope that everybody who is using our work, using our data, um, presenting on our information is going to ultimately link back and cite our work. That's not always going to be captured very easily. If I give five or six presentations in a year and, and I refer back to my work, even though I may, may have the DOI inside that PowerPoint presentation, there is no guarantee that any of these engines are going to find that DOI, find that reference, and link it to my paper. So how do you link forward? I call this forward citation. How do you link forward from the publication that you have worked hard to put out into the, into the community? How do you link forward from that to maybe new analyses of your data, maybe new um, presentations or derivative works from your originating work, um, maybe to blog posts about your work? How, do, how does that happen? So kudos allows you to do that. And I'm going to give it an, an example here of an article that was written a few years ago um, on a, a molecule called olympocene. Uh, the, the molecule looks like the Olympic rings. It was synthesized by uh, some people at University of Warwick. Um, the entire synthetic path, which was seven steps, as I recall, was made public and shared publicly on the, on the ChemSpider uh, Synthetic Pages website. So all of those steps were made were made public, and about three years later, as I recall, the work was finally written up and released. And this is that this is that publication. I'm, I claimed the publication. Uh, here it is. I've claimed it now on Kudos. This is the this is the actual article. Of course, it's a matter of searching by DOI and, and just claiming it, or searching on your name and claiming it. Uh, I believe Orchid support may be there. So now what have I done? All I've done is I've said, my Kudos profile has this article. Well, not really a big deal. Google Scholar will do the same. Orchid will do the same. LinkedIn will do the same. So what is the advantage? Well, the advantage comes with all of the things I can enrich it with. This turned out to be a very big deal. When you make a molecule that looks like the Olympic rings just before the London Olympics, it ended up with uh, a part of Huffington Post, Daily Mail, it has its own Wikipedia article. Um, the, the, uh, all of the seven steps of the synthesis are sitting on a website that we could point to. Uh, and then a pile of publications had actually been published on Olympocene with this unique name that we claimed before we even published our article. So there were works before we published as well as later works. It turned out that this particular class of chemicals turned out to be very, very interesting. And uh, a lot of other scientific work has gone on to be done uh, afterwards. What you see here is linking out, out from the originating article to other things of interest. And I don't believe today that any of the publishers are doing uh, a, a, a job anywhere close to this in terms of allowing you to, on your own article, link it up to things of interest, your own blog posts, um, news articles that may come about it, et cetera. Most of the citations come back. They are doing a job to try and show as much of that as possible, but they don't allow you to make that manual association yourself. I think kudos is uniquely placed for that, and therefore has value. What about data sharing? So over the years, I've curated 
for hundreds of data sets. We, we've generated many data sets that we've used for building models. We've built models. We've got presentations about, about data, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there are many sites that could be used for this. I'm just going to mention one that, I, that I've used myself now. They have a, an association already with the American Chemical Society, I believe. I think Wiley has an association with them. Uh, Elsevier has Mendeley Data. Um, PLOS, I believe, is using Figshare. So I, I like this site. I've been using it since very early when it, when it came online. Uh, I'm not sure you can see it on the, on the slide there, but it says there's over 62,000 views of, uh, of the data that I put up here, o uh, over 10,000 downloads of what I put up here. That includes slide decks as well as, as direct data. But this is a place that we put data. Um, again, you see the ORCID ID right here below my name. Um, so I, the ORCID ID is associated. The data sets, the presentations, everything I put here has its own digital object identifier that is, that is put onto it. And then I push this out and anybody can use, consume the data. Um, I tend to put uh, free licensing on it so that people can use it as they choose. So I like Figshare a lot for this purpose. Uh, they are closely associated with the altmetric efforts because they're through digital science. So even an altmetric donut shows up. You can see the shares, the downloads again. So this is a file that we put up of chemical structures uh, for the purpose of mass spec um, identification. So this is where I tend to load my supplementary info also and then reference it. Now we go quickly into altmetrics. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of altmetrics at this point. What is our impact as a scientist? Well, it's the, the usage is the downloads and views of our, of our publications commonly. But of course, it should include our presentations. It should include our reports. They don't all have to be peer reviewed. We are still providing value when we, when we give this stuff away to the community. There is the contributions we make through, as an impact through our peer review. There are expert opinions. Um, we have citations and alt metrics. So impact story is one place that I use for this particular information. Um, impact story, notice the URL structure. Uh, says directly that it's got uh, an ORCID right at the end there. So again, ORCID proliferation. Uh, this is free for you to use. They, they allow you to see the impact of your top, of your latest 100 publications. Um, you see activity uh, on, on each of your publications as you drill down. So I can show that most here. This is one particular article published on PLOS One. It gives you details. And this updates every time you visit the page. So saved and shared 262 times. Mendeley saves tweets about it. And you can drill down into it. And here you see all of the activity around this particular article. It is, it's a pretty much a one-stop shop for you to find out all of the engagement with your article that's been going on in the online community. Now, whether these numbers are 100% accurate, that is the challenge. There are various platforms that are doing this, and you will always find discrepancies uh, at a quantitative level between these, but they are indicative at least. Many of you will already be have recognized things like the altmetric scores and donuts that you see on an increasing number of, of publisher sites at this point. You see it in, in various ways. You'll see this, I think, on the Wiley site and some of their journals. Uh, this is, I think, on Springer. Um, this is what the one I'm, I most commonly see. And in this case, we're seeing a particular score. The, the color scheme is telling you what type of um, what type of systems have picked up on the article and have spread information about it. So this article was picked up by news outlets, was blogged about, was tweeted. It's on Facebook pages. Um, it includes Wikipedia, policy documents, etc. So this happens, uh, this happens automatically. You can, you can find this information on any article. And literally all you need to do is, uh, this is the way I've done it, it's the simplest, is to download the altmetric bookmarklet which, will in, which you can drag to your browser um, bookmark bar. And then when you, look, when you go to your article, you click, click on, on Altmetric it, and it will load uh, this particular donut with this limited information. And then you can click through and start drilling through the tweets, uh, the Wikipedia article that's associated, et cetera. So recently, uh, working with my postdoc, uh, we've been making sure that He's taking advantage of these ways to share information about his articles, and this is actually 
his um, the rep representation of his work right here. Um, I've taken advantage of, of the fact that these are available as little plugins. So on my blog, um, what I've actually done is listed all of my publications on one page, and I put in a few lines of code, very simple code, that shows me the altmetric bookmarklet here for every article, refreshes every time I open the page, as well as there's another platform called Plum Analytics. Um, they're also doing similar things, and I'm sure many of you will, will remember them from their association with EBSCO. And this is links to Wikipedia, uh, Crossref, Citation Index, um, Mendeley readers, etc. So I, I embed these directly in the page. So for 180 articles, book chapters, all of these are, are right, right in my face every time I log to the page. Now we move to Google Scholar uh, citations. Uh, I've been using this since the very beginning. I came online and I jumped on it. And this is where um, my articles are, are retained. I can see the citation counts. I see the uh, the graph on the right-hand side showing growth in citations over the years, which is something that you would expect at this point. Um, also, my list of co-authors that I claim. Um, Google suggests that I might want to monitor their work so I can actually get emails directly saying, you know, your colleague has just published a new article, one click through. The most valuable piece to me, there are two. One, uh, I find out immediately when people have cited my work. And commonly, if they cite in my work, it will likely be interested, of interest to me, which is very beneficial. And also, when I land on the page, and there is a warning that tells me, because they understand the context of my work, you may be interested in these particular articles. And they let me click through. I would encourage you to manage your profile, um, because uh, certainly in my case, Anthony Williams, uh, it's a very common name. So. Um, there was a point recently where 70 new articles associated with A.J. Williams, uh, Anthony John Williams, showed up against my profile, and, and none of them were mine, and I had to prune them out, which is very easy. You simply select them, and you can delete them. So man manage your profile. Uh, make sure that they are all yours. So uh, coming to the end, there's a, there's a lot more I could discuss. There are so many tools, so many applications. And these are the ones I prefer to use. Uh, I've spent a lot of time distilling down to this subset. It's where I find the greatest value for myself. But I would recommend you register for an ORCID ID if you don't already have one. Um, if you do have one, I would recommend you visit your ORCID page, your profile, and make sure that it is up to date, that it has your latest works on it. Um, and make sure that it, it is as complete a profile as it can be at this point. Uh, it's not a matter of will or could be successful, which is a conversation from a few years ago. It absolutely is successful. It's a great service to us, and, and I think we should all appreciate it. I would encourage you to enhance your LinkedIn profile. Uh, I've given you some ideas of how to do that. Um, it does take some time, and, and don't jump in too deep and spend hours and hours on it. Distribute a, you know, an, an hour a month just to bring it up to speed. Or go big and go home. Um, you know, put all of that work in and, and make it rich and rich and uh, and strong as a profile for yourself. Uh, Google Scholar citations. I, I like it. I use it. I, I find it very valuable, keeping me informed of my peers and their work. And but curate it. I would choose between ResearchGate or Academia.edu. Um, I use both. I, I I have a preference at the moment towards ResearchGate simply because many of my colleagues work there. I would recommend that you use Kudos and Publans. They have very different purposes, but I hope I was able to distinguish what the value would be. And it is easy to allow your profile to be built. If you go on Google today and do a search on your ORCID ID, you will find yourself proliferated already. And it's happening. People are already building information around your profile. They are grabbing data from all of these sites. And you have to be comfortable with that. And if you're not, then you need to back away from these types of systems. Um, there are, of course, privacy issues, but we are living in a very public world, uh, and that's that's not really our choice any longer. So I would encourage you to participate your, with, in your profile, control it, make sure that, that the representations you have there are appropriate, and share share your data, your papers, and your presentations. There are various versions of this talk. This is uh, I know this is almost an hour, and there are there are workshops sitting on SlideShare. This is where you will find mine. Uh, you can contact me at this particular email, and I hope that you consider using um, these types of approaches because ultimately, I believe we all want to have an impact. And the question is, how is that measured? 
how does that contribute to our career progression? How does that contribute to our alt metrics, to our funding sources? Without understanding fully who the audience are on here, it's difficult to identify how it will benefit each of you. But I believe it's a, it's a very strong possibility that it would. And I will hand over to Michael to uh, moderate. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I want to thank you for all your uh, for all of your uh, wonderful advice and all that wonderful information. I do want to before I turn over a question. I do want to mention one thing. Um, as as ACS Publications, I do want to comment on the fact that I know that a lot of these um, scholarly. Uh, communication networks um, may contain versions of record for publications that may or may not have been um, uh, uploaded with a publisher permission. So sometimes publishers still have copyrights uh, on those articles, and they've somehow made it out onto the um, to the to the greater internet and to, to these sites. And I think it's as we encourage researchers to use these sites, um, it's it's. Sometimes I think a lot of researchers have been misled on these points, and it's important for all of us um, as members of the scholarly community to understand uh, and how this research can be widely facilitate, uh, widely spread and shared, uh, but without infringing copyright. And um, we as ACS Publications, in addition with a lot of other publishers, have worked on creating a site, a great resource that I hope everyone will be able to note down. Um, it is called How Can I Share It? Um, it is a one-stop shop to kind of find out information about sharing works from um, from member publishers. Um, and so I, I would encourage everyone to visit uh, How Can I Share It, all one word, dot com, if they have an opportunity after this uh, webinar to, to learn more about that issue too. So, um, Tony, let me. I'm going to start with the uh, first question that I've got is that um, can you talk a little bit about how much time you spend updating each one of your sites or uh, app, uh, applications? Um, it's uh, the the question is you know it's sometimes difficult to understand whether you uh, if it's a five minute update daily type of uh, resource or it's something that you have to spend hours doing every week or every month. Uh, just can you give us a ballpark uh, kind of discussion about that? Sure. So, so first of all, I do not spend time daily on on any social media accounts except for Facebook, which uh, which I didn't mention here, um, because for me that is for friends and family. It's not about it's, it's not about representing me scientifically to the community. I have friends who are scientists, so I do share things there for them. But it's a very tight network, so I do not spend time daily doing this. I tend to do things in in bursts. Primarily around when I've gone somewhere and given a presentation, uh, that presentation I will upload it to SlideShare within about 60 seconds. I generally put a copy to, to ResearchGate, again 60 seconds, a copy to academia.edu, uh, maybe a copy on Figshare even. So in about five minutes I've put four copies of that presentation online, um, a couple of clicks, and I have shared it via Twitter. I do do share it, share that presentation then with my colleagues via face, Facebook, my friends and family. Um, so I would say around every presentation, I put about 10 to 15 minutes work. And when you consider how much work you've done to gather the information that you've presented, the time is taken to get there and do that. I think it's 15 minutes well spent. If I go to an ACS meeting and I give five, six presentations, I do that for every one of them. I, I, I tend to not leave the meeting without sharing every one of them. Uh, LinkedIn. I visit, I, I visit it um, uh, probably every day. I visit it for about two minutes just to see what my network's doing, see if anybody's trying to ping me with information. Um, I would say I probably spend about an hour, an hour a week max at this point doing anything. If I have a publication go out, and I wish I could publish every month, I don't. For every publication I put out, I probably put out about an hour of work to make sure that I claim it on kudos, uh, make sure that I, I highlight it on um, on LinkedIn. Make sure that it shows up uh, via Twitter. Twitter, I I don't post once. The publishers only have time to really push your your article once with one tweet. Um, you need to do it at the right time of the day because because twi Twitter is very very noisy. There's so much of it. So I put that a link out uh, via Twitter two or three times a day for at least a week. Um, so, you know, I would say about a, about an hour a week. It's certainly not hours and hours a week. 
All right. Thank you, Tony. Let's see. Um, I, I'm encur I encourage everyone to continue submitting their uh, their questions. Um, I've, let me go to the next one. Um, I know you didn't mention, mention much about Twitter uh, today, but just as kind of, I guess, a general question from this from this attendee, um, what is? Do you have any uh, best practices or best advice on ways to sell researchers on joining Twitter um, and encouraging them to use it? So the first slide that I actually took out of this presentation uh, that came after the title slide was uh, pretty much is what I'm about to tell you, self-marketing or narcissism. And the answer is yes, it's both of those. Uh, and I think you have a, a narcissism is seen as a very negative thing, I know, but really it is, you know, reflecting on yourself and seeing what you want to share about yourself in a, in a good way. Take away the negative slant here. I think many scientists, uh, certainly of the, of the later generation that I've engaged with on, in this, um, see this, these platforms as, as negative. They see them as um, distracting. They don't want to put the time in. Um, I think it's a matter of showing the value. I hope that with what I'm showing here that people see that there would be value, but I believe you've also shown up because you're interested. There are many scientists I talk with who say not interested. You have to... You have to push on the open doors. So I would encourage you to talk to those those scientists in your department, um, specifically that are maybe earlier in their career, who don't who who have a problem in maybe getting funding, who need a, a greater awareness out there in the community, because established scientists commonly don't. Um, that that's a personal opinion on that. I think Twitter is very very useful for for spreading the message. But you've always got to link it back to something of value. A few, you know, 140 characters, that, that needs to connect you to something with a, with a much better story. Um, and that's where you really need to put the work. I would encourage your, you to work with people to make sure they use things like, like blogs. Um, I would encourage people to participate in things like Wikipedia and make a point of saying you're contributing to science out there. Twitter is one of those things that's very easily judged. It can be great and it can be very negative. So it really depends on the people you're talking to. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I'm, I'm interested to know. Well, I, I, I um, and to to who submitted the question, please, if you have a follow up, please feel free to to use the Q and A box to uh, to send another question or a follow up. Um, turning gears a little bit, Tony, um, someone's asking about um, using social media and these networks to manage and distribute research from uh, from. Um, people in a department. So if, if you're in charge of, of uh, kind of sharing research at more of a department level, uh, do you have any recommendations or advice on trying to do it on maybe of a larger scale than just yourself? So uh, just to clarify, is it about sharing? Is it the, taking the role of sharing departmental information about the research or is it, uh, or is it measuring the um, the altmetrics and impact of oh, that research in the department. Explicitly uh, distributing the research from people in a department. Okay, so uh, I'm going to interpret that as primarily based on publications and presentations rather than sharing their data, because I think the scientists would prefer to remain in control of their data dissemination. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said for figuring out how to interact with the largest scale community so that you have, um, and by that I mean, t you know, the science that is done and published, how do you transform that, transform that into something that is uh, more engaging to a wider audience? What's the benefit to the public? How will it impact um, the discovery of uh, new plastics, things like that? And, and that is, we have somebody who works here in the center who, who has that explicit role. Um, she works closely with the scientists. She, she talks to us about how can our work be transformative. Um, I would encourage you to, to engage with the scientists who want to see their work seen that way. Um, and then there, there is the underpinning research, which is the publications, the presentations. Try to figure out how to connect them together because ultimately the scientists don't only want the public transformative benefits talking about their greatest benefit comes from when their science is, the science at the science level, publications, data, et cetera, is visible and used by others. So it, it's a great role, um, and there are certain tools to use. And just to, if you wanted to measure your impact at doing that, then I think you have to go full circle and start looking at the altmetrics. 
when you put something out about one of your scientists' works um, and link back to a publication, does that publication get talked about in news outlets? Does it get put, uh, talked about on blogs? Um, one of my colleagues here recently sat through one of my presentations and he said, you know, I wanted to know about this one publication of mine. And he did had no idea that he could determine with one click, altmetric.com, the uh, altmetric book. Language. He's discovered that over 100 news outlets had spoken about his paper. They'd referred to it in articles, in newspapers. He had no idea. Imagine if you have the role now of trying to do that for your, all your researchers and you get to show them this is how many people, these are the groups, this, these, are the, these are the vehicles that have talked about your science. I think it's a great service. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Tony. Um, for, on, on my end, that uh, that wraps up uh, our Q and A time. Just because we're almost out of time, it's almost uh, 3 p.m. in the on the East Coast here in the United States. Um, and so, what I want to do is take a moment to first thank Tony. Uh, thank you for all the information. Thank you for all the great pieces of advice. And you know, t Tony is. Uh, he, I think he shared his email address and places to find him. But you know, I, for me at least, you know, staying connected I think is an important um, uh, piece of what I've learned today. And I, I've learned a lot too, Tony. So I, I greatly appreciate that as well. Um, so on behalf of the Division of Chemical Information and ACS Publications, I want to thank you all for attending. A link of this video recording will be provided uh, to everyone who has registered for the event. Uh, in addition to, we will be working with our partners at SIMF to be able to place a copy of this recording um, on their website as well. And so again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, and if you do have, keep, please keep the conversation going. Um, reach out to Tony or any of us uh, within ACS Publications or SIMF if you have any questions or have anything else. And so with that, uh, I'd like to to um, go ahead and end the webinar, and thank you again for attending.